Hey everybody, I'm James Kozman. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, My sobriety date is December 13th, 2003. And I have a home group which meets on Monday nights at 7 p.m. It's the Forever Newcomers Group in Hickory, North Carolina. We meet at uh, Peace United Church there. <clears throat> and as Dean's already told you, I have a sponsor and he has a sponsor. You know them both. And they're, there are quite a few familiar faces in the room. Um, several of the people that I know in the room are people that uh, I originally met them in prison as we called them volunteers, but I, you know, I know now they're not really volunteers. They're just coming as outside members, regular civ uh, civilian members of Alcoholics Anonymous coming for a meeting in prison. Um, I know I'm supposed to come in here and tell you what it was like what happened and, and what it's like now and I hope that somehow or another in me telling you my story that you'll get a, a glimpse of the miracles that I've experienced through the process of uh, being in this program working this program in my life <clears throat> um, I when I was a kid I was always in like gifted and talented classes and I always told myself that I would never drink alcohol or use drugs and I'm not going to talk about drugs from up here, I've, I've been instructed, you know, not to do that. I've always been told not to do that. But I will say that drugs are an important part of my story. I did use drugs, a lot of them. And, uh, but, but I'm a bona fide alcoholic, and I know that. I know that I, whenever I drink alcohol, I experience the phenomenon of craving that's described in the, in the book. You know, once I start drinking, I can't control how much I consume. <clears throat> and often leads to blackouts. And, and worse than that, it leads to some pretty... Uh, great humiliation and, and tragic occurrences because I do some crazy stuff when I get to drinking alcohol um, and I'll tell you about some of those here in a minute but I'm, I'm going to try not to stay too much into a drunk, in a drunk log so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the drinking part of it and tell you more about what happened and what it's like now but <clears throat> I, I told myself I'd never drink uh, and my dad and my mom split up. I think it was 1980. I was about 12 years old, 13 years old. And not long after that, my dad got remarried. <clears throat> and for some reason or another, I didn't go to the wedding. But I went over to his house, and he had like a case of champagne sitting there on the floor. And I don't, you know, I don't know if this is the way it is with everybody. But for me, I never, a lot of times I didn't plan to drink. It would just be one of those spontaneous things, you know. And this the first time was like that with me. Now, I'd... I'd had a glass of wine or a sip of beer all my life. You know, my dad would give me a little little taste or we'd get to drink a glass of wine at a meal, but I never felt the, the effects of alcohol before this. But <clears throat> I asked him what that case of champagne was, and he said it was leftover from his wedding. And he said, here, you can have a bottle. And I think he was just giving it to me as a souvenir. And I remember picking that thing up saying, I'm going to see what this does. And I don't know what triggered that off, but I just said, I'm going to see what it does. And I remember... Not long after that, it was Saturday night, and I know it was Saturday night because I was watching Saturday Night Live on a little black and white screen TV, one that would plug into the, the, the van battery. And I don't remember, yeah, we, we'd watch it in the car. My, kid, my parents used it like as a babysitter, you know, when we were younger. But, um, but I was watching that down in the basement by myself, and I popped the top on that champagne bottle, and I drank it. I drank the whole bottle. I think I was 13, might have been 14, um, and it felt good. You know, people talk about it being a social lubricant and, you know, stepping outside of your skin and all that. And I don't know exactly how to describe what it did for me because I wasn't in a social setting. I was just by myself. But I felt great. I felt like I'd never felt before in my life. I felt so good that I wanted some more. Um, the phenomenon of craving kicked in that first time I drank. And so I stumbled up the stairs and got a corkscrew. My stepdad at the time had a little wine rack in the in the the crawl space part of the, the cellar of the house, and I was in the finished part of the basement. And I went and got a bottle of wine out. And, I, and this is the first time I've ever drank. I probably weighed about 130 pounds, and I popped the top on a bottle of wine, and I remember watching it just go. <laughs> and the next memory I have, my sister, I'm up in my bedroom the next day, and my sister's cleaning up purple vomit, and it stinks in the room. And I, I remember I felt worse than I'd ever felt in my life. And I'd been pretty sick from other stuff, but I felt terrible. I remember that day, I don't think I could hold down a drink of water for about six or eight hours after that, but I was really, really sick. And my sister convinced me that my mom didn't know what it was, that she thought I just had the flu or something. But looking back, I know she couldn't have been that dumb because it, it, you know, it was obvious that I had tied one on. And, you know, I think I said that classic 
that classic thing to myself, gosh, that's terrible. I'll never do that again. But the following weekend, somebody mentioned, hey, let's go drink some alcohol. And I went and stole some of my stepdad's, I think it was gin. And um, we got drunk on that. And the next morning after that, I had a terrible hangover. Uh, and those are two beverages that after that, I didn't drink ever again, really, for a long time. Gin and wine. I, could, I got so sick off of wine that first time I drank it, I couldn't even smell it without, it, you know, kicking in the gag reflex. Um, and gin, I don't know why anybody ever drank gin. <laughs> but, but I continued to drink um, at a young age, and I was real creative about how to get alcohol because I wasn't old enough to drink. As a matter of fact, the first time I quit drinking, I quit drinking before I even became of age to be able to purchase it. But, but we could always get somebody else to buy it for us. And even more importantly, I started doing some work with my stepfather at the time. He, he ran a, a convenience store kind of in the heart of Durham. That's where I grew up. And uh, I would go help him for like $2 a night. I'd go help him. I'd sweep and mop and, and steal a, bun a bunch of beer. Um, <laughs> I had I'd figured it out. They had a grocery basket in there, and they'd get all the cardboard boxes and put in there, and I'd hide a case of quarts of Coors beer down in there and, and bury it in cardboard boxes, and he had a pickup truck with a camper shell, and I'd slide it all the way up in there, and it'd be dark, and I'd make off with a case of quarts every time I, I went to work there, and that would last me a pretty good bit of time. But um, So that's how I, I maintained my alcoholism then and and i don't remember exactly what happened but um my stepdad and my mom came to the realization that my life was out of control before i did you know i guess i was coming in and blacked out passing out and stuff like that at a real young age and they and they carted me off my stepdad came to me one day and said uh he said uh we're going to take you to a place, you know, pack up a couple of days worth of clothes. We're going to give you a ride somewhere. We want you to take a look at this place. So I did what he said. I just kind of fell for it. And they dumped me off at a group home there in Durham on Trinity Avenue. And I wound up there. And that made it a little bit tougher to, to maintain my alcoholism. But I found a way. Um, you know how we do. I, they, they kept the cash box in there and I somehow or another wound up with a set of the keys to the whole place. And I was a criminal. I, I'm just going to say I had, I had criminal ways about me, but, but I, I, I figured out the code to that box too. You know, I figured out how to get it open. I'd go in there and get a little bit of money here and there and, you know, go do my thing. And <clears throat> finally I was hanging out with some guys in the neighborhood. Now this, that group home was in a bad neighborhood, but you know, I don't know how you guys are, but, um, you all are, but I would, I'd hang around with anybody when I was drinking. I would go in any neighborhood. It didn't matter. I just, you know, if it, if I thought I was going to be able to go get a buzz, it didn't matter. And, uh, so I wound up hanging out with these, these people and, and they started talking about, you know, breaking and enterings and all this. And I said, well, I know where there's a box full of cash right now. And so we went over there and they had a ladder and they tried, got over there, tried to pry. They couldn't get the window open. And finally, I just used the keys and went in the office and got it, opened the window and handed them the box and went back out, locked my way back out. So we staged a little breaking and entering there. And they, um, the next day I got caught for that. That was, uh, I don't know how I got caught for that, but I, I got caught. And my, my probation officer at the time, she liked me a lot she didn't want me to have to go to kitty prison well I think they called it juvenile detention back then but so she she decided to send me to rehabilitation to a rehab and <clears throat> so my first rehab center was at Pinehurst Treatment Center uh, down in Pinehurst North Carolina and um, and I remember going there and it was all adults I was the youngest one there and I met a bunch of people and I learned a lot about alcoholism. They taught me about the phenomenon of craving and um, you know all the different the different parts of it. We read. I got introduced to the AA literature and AA meetings and all that stuff. And I remember them telling me um, that if I was a real alcoholic, that I had a, a few options. I could either get sober, I could die an alcoholic death, or wind up with a wet brain. They were just you know. But they talked about the hopelessness of it. I don't think I had gone far down enough then because um, I wa and this is this is how dumb I was back then. I watched a whole group of people that were in that rehab center leave the facility and get drunk, and they brought beer back in there with them, and they all got caught and they all got kicked out. And here I was in there uh, by way of my probation officer, basically under under the threat of of going to juvenile detention if I got any trouble. But the next night, another guy, after all these people got kicked out, came to me and said, you want to go get some beer? And I said, yeah. 
And we went and got some, and sure enough, we got caught and got kicked out just like the first batch of people did. So. <laughs> but my probation officer was really nice, and, and she wound up taking me to another, another rehab center. This is at like 14 years old, you know. Um, and I wound up at, a, at an adolescent care uh, unit, I think was the name of it. It was at, in Burlington, Alamance County Hospital. And I wound up going there, and they took us to AA meetings there and stuff. But I don't want to stay in that too long. Uh, I got out of there, and I didn't quit drinking. Um, I didn't stop drinking for a long time after that. I wound up in and out of jail. I, you know, I didn't do a lot of long stints. I remember I did 60 days in jail one time, and it felt like about 10 years. I mean, it was just a, it was a long time. Um, I remember when I was doing that 60 days in jail, something, some kind of epiphany came and said, you know, I'm in here because of my drinking. And I said, I will never drink again after I leave here because this 60 days in jail is hell. <coughs> um, and I got out. My stepdad at the time picked me up, and he said, I know you're thirsty. I got these ice-cold beers right here. And I reached right in there and grabbed one. I told myself for 60 days every day I'm never going to drink again. But there I was drinking as soon as I got out and uh, right back down the same road. I wound up in, in another rehab, which was at, it was an experimental one. It didn't use the 12-step program. They took us to, to, uh, to AA meetings and stuff, but they were more cognitive-based or psychology-based or whatever. But I was, I was inpatient. I was housed at the mental hospital there at Meyer Ward. Um, I always joke around. I say, I've been, to, I've been kicked out of four mental hospitals in my life. I've been kicked out of quite a few mental hospitals. Um, and I don't think it's because I'm not crazy. I think it's because I'm an alcoholic, and I think um, skilled professionals in that field know that there's not much they can do for alcoholics. So, But anyway, I was at this one, and we did kind of the same thing. I, I wound up drinking while I was in there, and I remember the night that we drank, we drank some wine because we would, we would leave during the day, walk across the street to the inpatient treatment, and then walk back over to the hospital, and we stopped at the store on the way back one time and, and had a little excursion. And uh, one, of the, one of the trustees or whatever they call them, orderlies there at the hospital, came and approached me later and he said, I can tell you're on something, I'm gonna test you. I said, you don't need to, I'm not gonna do it again. And, but the next morning at breakfast, the guy that I drank with, I said, man, that was fun, we need to do that again. <laughs> and, and that guy told me, he said, no, I'm not gonna do that. I said, huh? He said, he said he decided that he was going to check himself into a long-term treatment facility that was going to take a whole year. And I thought, this guy is nuts. He's going <laughs> to check himself into a one-year-long treatment. And uh, little did I know that it was going to take me a lot longer than that. I needed a longer stint than that treatment. Uh, <clears throat> I look back and think, you know, how short a period of time a year is. I just thought based on that 60 days of being incarcerated, how long that felt. Um, but anyway, I wound, up, I wound up making a decision then. I don't know how to describe what happened then, but something inside me said, well, maybe I need to do the same thing. We went to an AA meeting, and some guy that was assigned to me as a sponsor at the time made a suggestion that I start getting on my knees and asking God for the power to not take a drink every morning. And I started doing that, and I started thanking God for that. Now, I didn't, the other stuff, I didn't pray about that. I was just the drinking because I knew the drinking was what my real problem was. But um, some of that other stuff, I, I continued for a while. But I quit drinking. I, I stopped drinking for a while. And I, I didn't drink for about 12 years. And uh, I actually experienced a little bit of success in life. I got married for a while. I built a house and got a contractor's license. I still had an unmanageable lifestyle, though. You know, I didn't realize then that the problem really wasn't the alcohol the problem was me it still is me um because i am still crazy and my life is still to a degree unmanageable i just i thank god that you know that i have learned that i, I turn that over to him on a daily basis i remember watching a film about bill wilson and there was one of the old timers from the program probably one of the original members it was a woman her face was blacked out and she said something to the effect of, she said, what we do in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is we turn our will and our life over to God on a daily basis. And that's what I do now. But 
anyway, I, you know, I, I want to kind of jump on past the, the drunk stuff. I did a lot of crazy stuff drinking. I stole a lot of stuff. Um, I, I was very deceitful. I was very dishonest. And it was just all about me maintaining the buzz. I just I wanted to be drunk, and uh, and it was ugly. I, I had a lot of blackouts. I did a lot of really humiliating stuff, and some people would pat me on the back and consider me brave, but I really wasn't brave. I was a coward. I just drank a lot and didn't feel the fear. You know, that's that's what I think alcohol did for me. It took a lot of the fear away. And we know from the literature that that's that corrosive thread that goes through us you know that fear motivates us to do a lot of stuff um and that's one thing that i'm grateful this program has helped balance out for me is fear i still have some fear but it's not like it used to be but i uh after i i my marriage ended because of me going back to drink and i'll say this i'll tell this i I'd quit drinking for 12 years and i i was you know the other substances were a part of my life and my ex-wife said to me one time, she said, I think you should just drink. She said, drinking is legal. And I looked at her and I said, you've never seen me drink. And, and she saw me drink one time. She saw me drink one time and she came back to me and said, I don't think you should ever drink again. I think you should go back to not drinking. But you know, something about that, pre- something, I lost something there. Cause as soon as I took that drink after those years, that that uh, obsession kicked back in, and and I don't. It's more than just that. I didn't just sit around thinking about drinking all the time. I did stuff like I'd be driving home from work, and all of a sudden I would wind up in the parking lot of the gas station at the at the beer cooler grabbing two forties, and um, you know that I don't know how to describe that. I just did stuff without. It was just it was involuntary almost. But um, <clears throat> every time I started drinking. It was like jumping off a cliff. It didn't take long for me to get to the bottom. Uh, It just took a pretty far down bottom. You know, I think maybe somehow or another, the first few times I managed to hit a ledge or something, I didn't make it all the way down. But my wife and I split up. I wound up, I wound up getting so unmanageable, I couldn't maintain my own household. I wound up moving uh, up to Oxford, North Carolina in Granville County with my mother. And I went up there and uh, she, there, there was a man that lived across the street from her. He lived down in the woods in a little cabin that had power in it, but no running water. And uh, I liked to drink with him when I went up there. Um, I had met him when I, when I wasn't drinking. He had helped me build my mom's house for her. But, but this time, I, he, he was somewhere safe to go to drink, and I would go down there and hang out and, and do that. My mom always warned me. She said, don't, you don't need to be hanging around with him. He's a, he's a dangerous individual. She said, he'll stab you in the back. But, you know, I just never was a good listener, and I never paid much attention, and I thought I was, I was impervious to that. I didn't think that, that I needed to worry about it. Well, it turns out this guy really was dangerous. Uh, he had a reputation for pulling guns on people and shooting people. There were all kinds of rumors. Uh, later on, I actually read his criminal record, and there was one place in there where a judge had said, if you ever come before me again with a, with a firearm-related incident, I'm going to put you under the jail. That's what it said in his, in his record. <laughs> I had, a, I had a copy of his criminal record for a reason. Um, I was down at his house, I, and I'm, I want to not apologize, but what I'm about to say is pretty, uh, pretty serious, uh, but, I, but I share it as part of my story. I went down to his house. I told myself I'd quit hanging out with him because he did pull a gun on me one time without me knowing it. He was on the other side of a wall aiming a gun at me for no reason. I thought we were friends. <laughs> but one of my friends said, hey, he's got a gun over there. He's got a shotgun pointing at you through the wall. You need to go. And I left. And, but anyway, I, I wound up down there again drinking and drinking with him. And, and I, I had a blackout in the afternoon. I don't know exactly what happened. But when I came to, we were playing around joking. I thought everything was fine. I thought we were friends. And the next thing I know, he'd gone in his house and he came out. And he had a shotgun. And he pointed it right in my face and told me he was going to blow my brains out. And... uh I don't know if any of y'all have ever had that happen. You know, that's something that, that doesn't happen to me on a regular basis or hadn't. But it was scary. You know, it, it really scared me pretty bad. Um, there was another older gentleman there, and he got between us. And he was talking to this guy. He said, John, put the gun down, put the gun down. And I'm walking backwards. I don't really know what to do, but I get far enough away, I turn around and start running. And this is about an eighth of a mile from my mom's house through the woods, kind of through a trail. 
And I start running, and he yells up to me, he said, come on back down here. You know we're friends. You know we're like brothers. And I said, I'm not coming back down there. But while I'm walking back to my mom's house, something inside me said, you got to show this guy. You're going to have to, you know, let him know. And I decided that I was going to go back down there and shoot him. And, I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any thought of killing him. I just want to say I've read the law. I know a little bit about the law. There's a... There's a defense against homicide and, and stuff called voluntary intoxication. And basically what it says is that a person can be so intoxicated that they're not capable of forming the specific intent to kill that's a necessary constituent of premeditation and deliberation. And I know that's true because I did not have a specific intent to kill, but I did plan on going down there and emptying the clip into him. I was going to had a little twenty two rifle. I was just going to pull a Scarface on him. And Well, I found out it's not like in the movies. I went down there and I did shoot him. I shot him and, and after the first shot, I was going to empty the clip and I, I pulled the trigger and he just immediately fell to the ground. And I thought, oh gosh, that's kind of weird. And I turned around and left. And I mean, this is how drunk I was. I had taken this rifle out of the case and left it sitting in the woods and wound up leaving it down there and um, wound up going and getting in my, my vehicle and driving headed to my brother's and I was going to go to my brother's and tell him what had happened <laughs> on the way over there and my brother lived in this area that's called it's Creedmoor North Carolina you guys know where Creedmoor is I'm sure and that place back then was notorious for having a lot of cops you don't drive through their speed and you don't drive through their drinking and I don't I don't know what happened but I got pulled over and got a DWI and um, I went and blew the breath I refused the breathalyzer actually and uh, the officer was driving me over to the Granville County Jail, and on the way there, I broke down and told him what had happened. And uh, he said, hey, just stop talking. You don't need to tell me anymore. Um, <clears throat> he said, just just save that. And so um, later on that night, uh, uh, an investigator came in there talk, asking me questions, and one thing led to another. Uh, I was charged with first-degree murder. I found out he had, he had died from that, that shot had hit him in the lung. and. Uh, caused him to bleed to death, I guess uh, asphyxiated or whatever it would be on his own blood. But um, And this is the kind of stuff I never, you know, if you'd have told me that I was going to be a drunk when I was a kid, I'd have never believed you. If you'd have told me I was going to kill somebody, I would have never believed you. Now, my brother, on the other hand, my brother was a gun-toting individual. If you'd told me he was going to do that stuff, he was going to wind up doing a long stint in prison, I'd have believed that. He's, you know, my brother's nuts. But, but not me. I was a nice kid. But... <laughs> Um, I wound up uh, I wound up waiting for trial for about 15 months, and I remember I you know as soon as I got in there I knew that I needed to get my relationship with God straightened out. You know the thought didn't really cross my mind that I need to get back in AA. AA wasn't available in there, so I just started praying and reading the Bible and. Uh, doing what the, you know, there's, a, there's some kind of controversial literature in the in the in AA. Some of it talks about hearing God's will, hearing hearing God's voice or whatever, discerning His will on your own. And some of it talks about the dangers of doing that. But somehow or another, I got it in my mind that I had heard from God that I was supposed to go to trial with this case. And uh, my lawyer was coming to me saying, "Look, I got good news for you." They know he was a violent man with a bad record. Uh, his brother was an attorney at one time in this town. He said, they, he said, he's pushing this issue, but I've got the DA talked in to let you plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter. And, uh, and I said, no, nah, no, nah, I think, I believe God's told me I need to go to trial with this. And this, uh, this lawyer said, you don't need to go to trial with this. And I said, yeah, I think I do. And, and that's, I was that hard-headed. I was that convinced that that's what I was supposed to do. He originally came in there and told me that I, if I pled guilty, I could get like six, seven years. And then I said, well, you know, you can go talk to the DA and see what my sentence would actually be, but I'm not going to probably take it. And he came back and he said 10 years, and I turned it down. Um, and to make a long story short, I went to trial, and by some miracle of fate, I did not get convicted of first-degree murder, which I probably should have. Uh, but I got convicted of second degree murder and I got sentenced to 219 to 272 months. And I'm really good with math, but I was so, you know, shocked by the outcome. I could not figure out how many years that was right there on the spot, but it wound up being 18 years, three months. 
And after that, I somehow or another had it in my, you know, that in my mind, I believed that God was going to somehow or another get me out of this sentence miraculously, and he did. You know, looking back, I realized that I needed every bit of that time. Um, and and the, the next part of my story I'm going to tell you about is, is what it was like in prison because in prison is where I really got this program. I had a, I had a little experience about eight or nine months with AA in Charlotte, uh, I was a member of the Queen City group. That was my home group down there. And I, and I started experiencing some of the miracles of this program, but, but I left that behind and, and wound up in prison. I started noticing AA was advertised on the walls. They'd say, you know, AA, and I'd look at it, and it kind of catch my attention. And something inside would, me would say, you need to go. <clears throat> but I didn't for a while. Um, I didn't drink or use anything while I was in there, and all that stuff was available in, in there. Anybody tells you that going to prison is not available, they're wrong. It's in there. Um, as a matter of fact, I worked on a construction program for a while in there. I'm kind of jumping around the timeline, but they, they'd have these big pallets full of five-gallon buckets, and inside the heart of every one of those pallets, there'd be five gallons, they called it book, five gallons of potato beer or wine or whatever you want to call it, homemade alcohol cooking off is what they called it. And they knew the timing of when they'd dig into this pallet and get this five gallons out. And those guys would get drunk. I mean, that real drunk off that stuff. But, but I didn't. Um, there was something about the structure of being inside that fence and being told what time to eat and what time to shower and all that stuff that kept me from doing it. Something inside me, deep in my innermost self, told me from my experience that if I didn't do something different, I was going to get out and drink again. And I knew if I got out and drink, drank again, I'd probably die. I've left out a part of this story that like three weeks before I got incarcerated, I had like three near-death experiences. One of them, I'd flipped a van end over end. Um, one of them was the, the guy pulling the gun on me. But... I knew that if I drank again, I was doomed to die, and I, didn't, <clears throat> I, I felt like I'd been given a reprieve from that, and I wanted, I wanted to live. Um, a guy came up to me. I, I wound up getting transferred to a facility I did not want to go to. I wound up at the Alexander Correctional Facility. It's a thousand-man prototype. It was one of the first three of them like that built. It's very much like Central Prison. It's a big concrete building, maximum security. They call it close custody, and I got stuck in there. And it was terrible. I mean, it was at the first few weeks of being there, I literally thought I was going nuts. I filled out a mental health request, and I went and saw the shrink, and he giggled at me. He said, you need to get a job. And because uh, I'd been sitting around the first two weeks making Mother's Day cards. That's all I could do to, you know, to keep my sanity. But, uh, but I did get a job. And ironically, uh, I look back, and that, that facility became like a home to me. I wound up... Uh, Getting finding so much favor with the with the people at that facility that I could walk up to a door. I didn't have to hit a button to get it open. They saw me and they'd open the door. They knew I wasn't violating any rules or anything. But um, one of the guys there that I knew he and he wasn't sober came up to me and said, "You know they're going to start having Alcoholics Anonymous here. This place had just opened. I was like the first within the first hundred people there." Um, he said, "You going to go?" And I said, "Yeah." And uh, I started going to AA and. There's some people there. I, I guess it's okay to use their last names from up here. I don't think they'd mind if I did it. Barry Timberlake was one of them. If any of you guys know him, he's uh, pretty active in the, the corrections AA program. But um, this guy, these guys came in every week and brought the, brought the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I would come and I would share, but I always felt like there was something uh, hypocritical about me sharing in an AA meeting when I really didn't have it. You know, I, I, I had some experience with AA, but, but I really didn't have it. I, didn't, I hadn't worked the steps. I hadn't taken the steps in my life. I didn't have a sponsor. I heard a lot of other people share in there, that, and I knew nobody in there really was working this program, had this program in their life. But when I started going to these meetings, I went every week, and I knew that that was what I was supposed to do. But as soon as I started going every week, I knew that I needed to get a sponsor. I knew from my experience with AA that I needed a sponsor, and, and that's something that uh, I know even now for prisoners, that's one of, the, one of the greatest needs in there is sponsorship. So if any of you all ever have a chance to sponsor somebody that's in prison, that's, that's something that's really important. But um, 
I knew I was, you know, I don't, looking back, I know that I was exactly where I was supposed to be at the time because I was, I was going to AA meetings. Uh, I came up for, for custody promotion about a year, some, two years later, and I remember going in. They had a little panel of people that made this decision. I watched the time running out. but <clears throat> I went in there, and the first two guys that went in in front of me that were being uh, brought up for promotion of min- medium custody, excuse me, came back, and they immediately turned them down. And I went in there, and I still had a considerable amount of time left on my sentence, probably about 16 years. And they, they talked to me and asked me some questions, and then they sent me out of the room for a minute. And I went out and sat down. Um, then they called me back in, and they said, ordinarily, we don't give anybody custody promotion unless they've completed the DART program. Steve's probably familiar with that. And I said, well, you don't even have the DART program here. And I said, you know, I, said, I go to AA every week. And they said, that's exactly why we're going to go ahead and promote you. And, you know, I'd gone to, to AA every week because I knew I needed to go to AA, and they promoted me to medium custody. And, and I went from there. I basically stayed at the same facility, moved down the hall, and began working for the inmate construction program. And little did I know that that program was going to transfer me around from prison to prison. I, I wound up spending time at about 14 or 15 facilities. I forget exactly how many it was during my, during my bid. But it moved me around to the places I needed to be. Um, I eventually, and that, what would happen is I would get transferred somewhere I didn't want to go. I always felt like I knew where I needed to be or where I wanted to go. And, you know, it's the same way now. I think I know the best outcome that, you know, trying to think I'm the director. And I'm always wrong. But <clears throat> I wound up at Lincolnton in the middle of the summertime. I had been at a, another one of those thousand-man facilities working on the construction program and uh and I got uh, one, of the, one of the other workers there didn't like me too much, and he went to the boss and got me transferred, and I wound up at Lincolnton. And Lincolnton was hot. I remember I had not experienced sleeping in an environment that wasn't air-conditioned and not being near a fan, and it was so hot I couldn't sleep for about three nights. I was just laying there sweating. But I was exactly where I needed to be. Um, there was a guy that, that brought the meetings in there. His name's Bob Sweeten. I don't know if any of y'all know him. He's, he, he knows him. But... Bob was coming in, and, you know, I, I went to the meetings every week like I was supposed to, like I knew I should. I, know, I started noticing that Bob would say these real profound things in the meetings, and I would, uh, I would hear what he was saying, and I'd actually be able to shut down the ADHD that I have and listen to what he said because it was, it was pretty interesting. And we worked five days a week, ten hours a day, and then on the weekends we'd exercise and go out and walk. And I had this friend of mine that I used to walk on the yard with. There's like a circle we'd walk around for hours. We'd walk from like breakfast time till lunch. And one Saturday I'm out there walking, and there's Bob out there. And I was like, you know, and this is I'm, my mind's slow. It's burnout. I, I I drank pretty heavily and killed a lot of brain cells. But but I saw Bob there, and I was like, hey, Bob, what are you doing here? He said, well, and he's real real um, skeptical about telling me what he was doing. He said, I come in here and I work with some of the guys sometimes. <clears throat> and, uh, and I had a little conversation with him and walked on. And it was about 10 minutes later, it dawned on me, he's in here working the steps with people. And I said, gosh, that's exactly what I've been looking for. So the next meeting, I approached him and asked him if he would work the steps with me. And he said, yes. And I remember he told me that he came in once a month on Saturdays, that that facility had given him permission to use the sergeant's office. And he brought me a, a notebook. It was one of those uh, black and white little one dollar. You can get them for a dollar a piece at Walmart. But he had one of them. And to me, that thing was valuable. And he brought me an ink pen and a big book and a 12 and 12. And he started giving me some assignments. And the first ones were mostly just a lot of reading. But I knew something, something about that situation was perfect for me because I knew I had a deadline every time. He was going to be back in a month, and I needed to be done with what he had assigned me with for a month. And I knew I was only going to be at that facility for a short time because once that job was over, they're going to transfer me somewhere else. <clears throat> and I would, from time to time, communicate that to him. I'd be like, we need to hurry up, man. we got to hurry up. i got to get this done, you know, before they transfer me. He'd say, ah, you know, things will be just, you know, they'll work out exactly the way they're supposed to. Don't Don't feel like you need to plan that out and I think it was about 13 months into it that's when they transferred me and I remember you know I, I did the assignments he gave me uh, I remember doing my fourth step in there and I remember writing you know everything that I could think of down and it did not take me months to sit there and write that thing down it, it went really quick once 
I started writing and decided I, would, I was going to do it. The pen just flowed, and I got a lot written down. And there were many times later on I'd remember stuff, and I'd say, I need to go back in this notebook and write it down. And a lot of times I'd go back in there and realize I'd already wrote it down. I just, you know, didn't remember putting it in there. But um, I remember when we got to step 11, he kept talking about meditation. This guy kept alluding to meditation and talking about his experience with meditation. And I was just like, oh, you know, I thought I knew everything. I still am that way. I'm I'm one of those know-it-alls. And I thought the prayer and meditation were really just talking about the same thing. Um, And finally, he brought me this book called How to Meditate. And, uh, and I, you know, because somebody had brought me a book, I felt uh, obligated to read it, and I did. And I learned a little bit about meditation, and I started practicing some seated meditation there in the prison, in that crowded environment. I had people coming up cracking jokes, asking if I was trying to learn how to levitate myself and stuff like that. <laughs> but what I did learn is I learned that there's a, you know, there are some, the, the stuff that's written about meditation in the literature is true. You know, the, one of the first fruits of meditation is emotional balance. And I started experiencing some of that. And I think part of it was getting to that point in my step work where I started experiencing a little bit of sanity, realizing some things about myself. I started realizing that, you know, there, there's a lot of people in this world I really don't like. You know, just to be honest, there are people I don't like. And it's, there's no code or law that says I have to like everybody. There's also no code or law saying that they have to like me either, and that's something that's really, I think, it's acceptable, it's sane to, to realize that. And um, I remember one time I had an epiphany of, kind of along that lines. I was, I was, we, from that facility, we had to ride the bus like 40 minutes to a, a facility in Caldwell in Hudson, North Carolina. We were building a, a segregation building in the back there at the old ball field. And I was on the bus headed back to the facility from the job and some guys had said something to me they'd done something that really pissed me off at the job and i was sitting there just kind of seething about it and i started having this inner dialogue whatever it was whether it was god or just me but i started hearing these questions and one of them was you know how many people on this bus do you really really like and i looked around at the bus and i said none of them and, um, and then the next question was, how many of them you want to be friends with? And I said, none. And they said, well, why would you expect them to like you if you don't like them? Even if you're nice to them, they pretty much know you don't like them. You know, and I think that's a common thing. But anyway, the, the, the conversation went a little further. But I realized something about myself. And I had put it in my fourth step. You know, the, the common denomination was denominator in, in all of my interactions, all of my relationships is I cared too much what people thought about me, and it was irrational. You know, it wasn't, wasn't sane for me to expect people to like me or to re- respect me when I didn't like them and didn't respect them. Um, and I came, I came, you know, to the realization that I do need to treat people with kindness and with love, you know, but I also don't have to tie myself into a pretzel, like the literature says, to try to make people like me, and I, and I don't see myself doing that. And sometimes I kind of go to the other into the spectrum, I, I find myself nowadays sometimes saying things to people that might be a little harsh, you know. I don't know where I get that from, but um, but uh, I, I do want to say I, I wound up doing every day of that sentence, every single day. God did not get me out. I learned a little bit about law in there because I tried to fight my own case and lost. I won some other people's cases, a few of them, helping them with their case, but I didn't get any help. Um, <clears throat> I wound up, I wound up going to a, a facility there in Catawba County, which is where the city of Hickory is located, because I had heard about their work release program, and I wound up uh, being on work release for a while before COVID hit to save up some money before I got out. And, and I made all these plans. You know, this is what I was going to do when I got out, and I would tell my friends about it. I'd say, you know, I'm going to get out, and I'm going to get my contractor's license back, and I'm going to get into rental properties, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. But I also was very, I stayed very serious about the AA program in there, you know, so much so that some of the people in there didn't like me too much. Some of the people in there, you know, they would kind of act like you would a religious Bible thumper. But I, and I wasn't really thumping the AA big book. It's just when I, I was very serious about going to meetings and serious about sharing and serious about sponsorship and all that stuff. But... The first thing I did when I got out was I went to a meeting. 
you know, I had a, my parole officer drop me off at a, at a Oxford house and a friend of mine that had gotten out about a year before me picked me up and took me straight to a meeting. And I decided that I was going to treat it like it was my first day of sobriety. I was going to do 90 meetings in 90 days and I was going to stick with the same job for a while. Um, and I did. And uh, I started doing some of the things that I said I was going to do. I did. I went back to school to get my contractor's license. And I started school. I actually spent $1,300 on textbooks for, to, get, to study to get my contractor's license, not even knowing if the licensing board was going to let me take the exam or let me be a, li a contractor again because of my crime. And um, <clears throat> the guy teaching the class I approached him after about two or three classes and said, look, I bought these books and I did all this. I said, but I need to tell you something about myself. And he said, what is it? And I told him. And that guy, his name's uh, Neil Hudson there in, in Hickory, and he's a good friend of mine now. I see him at Lowe's all the time. I see him when I take my continuing ed. But I told him about and, and after a few minutes of hearing my story, he said, well, did your crime have anything to do with general contract? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, I think you're okay then. Just tell him the truth. And I did. I told him the truth. And I had to put a, you know, quite a few paragraphs explaining my criminal background and what I'd done. And it was a, it was a rigmarole. Um, and I, I was at this company that I've done my, my work release job at, Hickory Springs Manufacturing at Wire Technology. And I was so dirty that day, I took a shower at work. You know, they're, they're, they had some showers there. And I was literally standing there butterball naked, and the phone rang, and it was the executive director of the licensing board for general contractors calling me to give me the bad news. He said that's what he called it, bad news. He said, I got some bad news for you, because they had to have a hearing amongst themselves about whether or not they were going to let me um, take that exam. He said, you're still on parole. You know, this is how, that's how quick we, I had nine months of post-release supervision. That's what they called it. He said, you're still on parole and we cannot let somebody be a licensed contractor in this state while they're still on parole. He said, so we just can't do that. And I said, Ugh. he said, but we're going to let you go ahead and take the test. And if you pass it, as soon as you get off parole, you can be a licensed contractor. I was like, well, that's not bad news at all. And I went and took the test, and I will say it was the hardest test I've ever taken. I had taken it before in the 90s, and it, was, it wasn't easy then, but it was really hard this time. And when you take it on a computer, and uh, when I hit the button right when it was over, I was shocked. I thought I'd hallucinated when, I, when it said I'd passed, because I really didn't know if I'd passed or not. And a lot of my friends have taken it and flunked it, but, but I passed it. And it opened the door to a, you know, a whole lot of stuff. I, I, I don't have time to tell about all the miraculous stuff that's happened and I don't, I don't want to some of it doesn't really seem like it has to do with alcoholism but but I do own some rental property now you know that's another thing God just put me in the path with this old man who was selling off a bunch of his old uh, rental properties that most of them people would consider slums but I bought one of them that's uh, it's two duplexes on the same property and and I've been fixing it up and um, and I don't pay rent you know, every month when it's time to make the mortgage payment on that place, I'm actually collecting money instead of worrying about paying. And uh, um, I've made a lot of uh, friends, some of them in the program, some of them not. You know, some of them just, I, just my destiny puts me in their path or them in mine. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, real estate agents, other contractors, you know, just all kinds of people that I've, that I've run into. And I just see it uh, carry. Carrie used the term IBMs, itty bitty miracles, but but they happen to me every day. There's so many of them I can't even begin to describe or, or explain them all. I just it's gotten to where they're so regular. I just I just take them as they come. But it's it's really amazing. Um, I had some stuff while I was in prison. One I had a daughter pass away from a from a brain tumor. I never really knew her. She was 17 years old. She. Uh, I got news that she was having dizzy spells or something, and they diagnosed her as having like MS, but then they, they went and did some kind of scan and she had a mass, a small mass in her brain, and they did a, a biopsy and she wouldn't wake up after that. So they went in and took it out and came, when, when they got it out, they said it was a rare form of brain tumor and that she was probably gonna die from it, and she did very shortly thereafter. So I had four kids by my ex-wife <laughs> and then one from a, another woman after marriage. <clears throat> so that knocked me down to four kids. And then this past March, I had one take his own life. Um, and I, I don't know or think that he was 
one of us, but he had his own problems. Um, and, and he told me that he had problems, but I kind of disregarded it. I, I was so busy, and I didn't know. You know, when somebody tells you that they're having those kind of problems, you just don't know what to do. But uh, I remember he was, he was living in one of my apartments, and I, I got mad and went and knocked on the door. He and his brother were there playing video games, and I said, both of y'all need to get out. And uh, I probably should have called Robert before I did that. I thought, you know, I look back and say that's probably what I should have done. But, but I just took it upon myself. And it was all about parking and, and something I told them over and over and over not to do. And they did. And told them to get out. And, and he came and had a talk with me uh, that, that evening um, before he died. And, and we said some real important stuff. But little did I know that. You know, after he left there, that's the next thing he did. He went and got on the highway and drove up I-40 towards Raleigh, got to about Greensboro, pulled over on the side of the highway and went down in the woods and shot himself. And uh, that's been a pretty, pretty, you know, traumatic thing to go through. But but I'm okay. You know, I don't, I don't know how to word that. You know, that it's hard to say that. Um, but I'm okay. You know, and I realize that my sobriety isn't contingent upon everything going right you know a lot of stuff does go right but a lot of stuff goes wrong um but i'll still say that that my worst day now is better than my best days used to be i used to be miserable all the time and didn't even realize it it was like i had a toothache it's like i was born with a toothache and i was so used to having a toothache when when i finally had some some relief from the toothache it felt so good you know now if the toothache pops back up i, I want to get rid of it as quick as i can but Overall, life is very fulfilling. Life is very good now, and I attribute it to the, to the miracles of this program. I experience those promises all the time, and <clears throat> I, don't really, I don't really know that any words could describe it, but I'm sure there are plenty of people in this room that, that know exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, I wouldn't trade what I've got now for anything. I don't regret doing 18 years in prison. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I do regret that I missed my children's Growing up years, I did miss that. Uh, but I know that had I not gone into prison, I would have been dead anyway. I wouldn't have been around. And now the kids that I have that survive, I have a pretty good relationship with them. Um, it's better now than, than I thought it could ever be, to be honest with you. That's been some interesting amends. And, and I've made some amends since I've gotten out. Uh, a couple of them were recent financial amends with attorneys that I owed money from years, years and years ago. And uh, they seemed to be really shocked. One of them didn't even remember that I owed him money. He didn't even remember who I was. So that was uh, kind of interesting. But, you know, I, I, I don't really know how to describe it. I got a sister for 15 years. I didn't have any communication with my sister. Um, I, I got out and continued that. She was top of the resentment list, and she was also top of my amends list. And she, you know, she was somebody that I didn't bring up to my sponsor for a while because I really didn't want to deal with that, you know. But this other friend I had, I was talking to her saying, you know, you don't have any communication with your son, da-da. And she said, well, you don't have any communication with your sister. And I was like, ugh. So I got on Facebook, found my sister, and reached out to her. And, you know, the next thing you know, uh, she and I have a great relationship now. We're very tight. I talked to her on the ride up here. Um, where, you know, there's been a lot of healing in my relationships. I do know that the literature talks about our relationships with other people. You know, when I did my fourth step, that's what my fourth step was. It was a description of all my relationships with all the people in this world, you know, every one of them. And uh, it talks, so I can't word it verbatim, but something to the effect of that it's, it's our dysfunctional relationships with other people that are the immediate cause of all our woes, including our alcoholism. And, uh, and I know that, you know, it's a spiritual disease, but it's, it's a social disease. It's a relationship disease, too. It was my interactions with other people that, that uh, was a, a, an ingredient in it. And I know that now it's, it's a relationship with those people and my relationship with God that keeps me sober. And that's what, that's what this is about. But I also realize that I have to constantly remind myself that it's not about me you know i have i have a business now and uh i catch myself getting angry sometimes about <laughs> some of the things that go on at work and it recently dawned on me that i need to change my perspective that i needed to, re to start looking at 
my relationship with people at work as if I'm serving them, not them serving me, you know, and I, I feel like that might be the solution to that problem. But I'm going to go ahead and sit down now. I know it's 9 o'clock. If I go much later, I'm going to get guilty of doing like Paige does sometimes at the CLC. <laughs> So I really appreciate y'all. It's a privilege to be here, and I, I thank you for having me up.